Today we hear a story of people trying to trap Jesus by asking him loaded questions. No matter which way he answers, he's going to get himself into trouble with the civic as well as the religious authorities. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been in this situation a couple of times in my life. I started seminary one of the most tumultuous times in the history of the modern Roman Catholic Church in Boston. I began my uh, ministry career as a, a candidate for uh, the Archdiocese of Boston. And the year I began my studies was the same year that the sex abuse scandal broke in Boston. It seemed everyone was choosing side and one side was pitted against the other. And as the days wore on and the scandal increased, the divisions only widened. You had to be careful what you said and to whom you said it, as most conversations would be reported to the seminary administration. And if you didn't fit with the now very narrow view of who was in and who was out, uh, you were politely asked to leave. It was a dangerous time to be a holder of minority opinions. Well, the same situation has arisen here in the United States over the last few years. The gap between right and left, liberal and conservative are getting wider and wider. And most of us are hanging around somewhere in the middle trying to make sense of what's going on. Everything has to be black and white, it seems. There's no room for gray. And if you consider changing your mind on a particular issue, there's no room for that either. We can no longer have conversations. What we have are sound bites where one person waits for the other person to finish. And so they can pounce on them with their particular opinion. The extremes on both sides are running the show and they're so strong, so strong that when asked, they're not even denounced. But as you can see from today's reading and from today's story, the situation is not new, but really it's been going on since the dawn of time. Today, Jesus is caught in a no-win situation. If he declared that it was lawful to pay the tax, he'd win favor with the Roman authorities and avoid arrest and persecution. But if he ruled that even to carry the coin was sacrilege because the coins held the inscription that called Caesar the high priest, he might curry favor with the religious folks for a while, but risk angering the civil authorities who would arrest him and try him and persecute him. But Jesus being Jesus knew what was going on and what was behind the question. And he calls them out for it. And he flips the question around, not verbally so much as really what he's trying to say in all of this. And he flips the question around and he says, what bears God's image? This is the, the, the meat behind uh, this passage uh, today. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. So it leaves us with the question of what belongs to whom? Now, this verse is often quoted by those who believe that we need to pay blind loyalty to government officials and that by doing so, we're somehow patriotic. When Jesus says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's, we want to hear him describing two duties that can be discharged at the same time and therefore preserve our good standing as citizens of both the civic and the religious. However, Jesus puts them to the test. He's not searching for some middle of the road answer here. In fact, it's just the opposite of really of what he's looking for. The coin that Jesus holds up is stamped with the image of Caesar. But Caesar cannot come close to the commerce that animates us as human beings. Caesar will get many, if not all of the coins, but the coin of the realm of our flesh and blood is the image of God. What is rendered to God is whatever bears the divine image. Every life, every life, underline every, every life, is marked with that inscription. Every human being, again, underline every, every human being is an icon of the one who is its source and its destination. 
Now, the inscription on the coin makes a theological claim about Caesar uh, that can be considered blasphemous to those who hear this and see this in Jesus' community of believers. The words on the coin are a political threat. Caesar's interest in the well-being of his subjects stops at the point where his power over their livelihood is threatened. The theological claim, however, that Jesus is making about God's interest has nothing at all to do with power. The God to whom we render our days is the God described by the prophet Isaiah in the 49th chapter, verses 15 through 16. Can a woman forget her nursing child? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. The tender compassion of God for all of humanity is the product of our commerce, the inscription for all the rendering that we do. Now, all of us have fine lines to walk in the negotiations we make with the various kinds of commerce that make up our days. Most of us are collaborators some of the time and subversives some of the time. There is comfort and Jesus refusing to make the answer to the question an easy one. The answers are only simple to those on the extremes. Meanwhile, we, all of us, we bear God's image as it was written on the palm of God's hand. Now, true, it can be difficult, and we've talked about this before, it can be difficult to see the image of God in other people when we look at each other or when we look in the mirror. What we tend to see are the inscriptions that our business in the world has left with us. We see black, white, straight, gay, liberal, conservative, Christian, non-Christian. When we stop seeing the divine image in each other, we dehumanize them. And that makes it easier to call them names, to make fun of them, and to just discount them altogether. When we take humanity away, what is left? Nothing. And that's how we justify how we treat others. But underneath all of that, there's a much deeper mark. The kiss of light in the eyes, the watery sign of the cross made on our foreheads once upon a time, the image of all those children in the arms of their mothers, and the little ember of resolve to remember them. All of those faces, the faces of all humanity, are part of your face and part of my face. When we begin to see the image of God and the image that God sees, this is important, the image that God sees in us, the image engraved in the palm of the hand of God who in Jesus stands behind us with full faith and credit. So let us resolve this day to endeavor to see that divine image in each other. And then maybe we can start to bring heaven right here on earth. Amen.